Hello and welcome all to our 32nd seminar of the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation. I'm Marcella Carraher, a postdoctoral researcher at the Aphasia CRE and co-facilitator of the seminar series. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that this event and our participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. Today I'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri land. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future and extend this respect to First Nations people joining us online. We are very much looking forward to hearing from Dr. Jutta Isaacson, who is joining us from Denmark. Jutta will be presenting on accessible healthcare for people with aphasia through trained staff. Before I formally introduce Jutta, I'll briefly cover some housekeeping. If you haven't done so already, please join us as a member of the Aphasia CRE community of practice. We welcome people with aphasia, their family, friends, health professionals, researchers and organisations. Benefits to members include a regular newsletter, updates about events and activities, contributions to research, networking opportunities and more. The CRE is always looking for financial support. If you wish to donate, please see our website for details. This seminar is being recorded and you can find past webinar videos on the Aphasia CRE website. Just click on the resources tab. Don't forget to visit our resources page while you're there, including aphasia friendly COVID-19 resources. You can connect with us on social media via Twitter and Facebook. Feel free to tweet along today and use the hashtag aphasia CRE. Hopefully this seminar will spark lots of questions. You can write your questions in the Q&A function on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please use this rather than the chat function. Enter your question at any time during the presentation. You'll be able to see questions asked by other audience members. You can like or upvote a question to show those that are most interesting to the group and the most burning questions will rise to the top of the list. At the end of the presentation, Dr. Isaacson will answer as many questions as time will allow. Please reserve this Q&A space for questions only. Keep your questions brief and no comments, please. It's now my privilege to introduce Dr. Jutta Isaacson from Denmark. We thank you especially for getting up early to speak with us today. Jutta is an Associate Professor at the Department of Language and Communication at the University of Southern Denmark. She has a background as a speech pathologist. Jutta lectures in the speech pathology and audiology programs in evidence-based practice, qualitative research methodologies, neurogenic communication disorders, and other clinical subjects. Jutta's research is centered around communication with people with aphasia, for example, communication partner training of health professionals, but she's also interested in outcome evaluation of aphasia therapy, involvement of people with aphasia in research, and supporting access and services for people with aphasia in low and middle income countries. A brand new project of hers is about families living with aphasia and how to make sure that they get support throughout the care pathway. I'll pass over to you now, Yuta. Thank you very much, Marcella, and also a big thank you to the CRE Aphasia, Professor Miranda Rose for the invitation and for John and Kelly also helping out arranging this together with Marcella. I will share my slides. Yes, so as Marcella already said, I'll talk to you today about accessible healthcare for people with aphasia. And um, it might be more correct to say attempting to make healthcare accessible because I'm not quite sure that we are there yet. I would like to acknowledge a lot of people and institutions that I have done this, this research that I'll present to you today together with, and also acknowledge the different funders we have had. 
So today's program is uh, starting with a short introduction uh, to the topic, and I will talk to you about what the story is with communication partner training, which is really the topic of today for health professionals in Denmark, because quite a bit have, has been done over the years. I will give you three snapshots from Danish CPT projects, communication partner training projects, and I will also have just one slide about new projects and the needs that I hope to work with also in the future. And then, as Marcella said, there's time for questions and comments. I should say that much of the presented research today is only published in, Den in Danish as research reports, but yeah, planning to, to write it up and for some instances, I'm in the middle of writing it up, but uh, as many of you would know, it takes time. So accessible healthcare. I think we uh, have many reasons for aiming to make healthcare accessible. First of all, I see it as a human right. And fortunately, many other people see it as a human right as well. Um, for example, the United Nations, uh, World Health Organization have the Convention of the Right of Persons with Disabilities, and they have a whole chapter actually on uh, accessibility uh, within communication as well. Uh, we have national legislation in each of our countries, wherever we are placed, or at, at least I guess many of us would have, and also there are ethical imperatives for us uh, wanting to, as clinicians, as researchers, to involve people uh, also with aphasia uh, when it comes to, uh, to their healthcare. So they can be involved in, in making decisions in, um, yeah, whatever is, <laughs> is uh, available for them so that they know what they say yes to, what they say no to, uh, and also not just yes and no, but also actually make an informed decision of, of, of whatever is being offered to them. So how can we uh, make healthcare more accessible? Well, I will use alternative and augmented communication or AAC as the broad term. And I think with in that hat, we can do many different things. And as I, I have said already, communication partner training is what I'll be speaking to you about today. And with that, there'll come some definitions later on, but with that, I mean that staff is trained to be able to uh, support communication. And then uh, we can also make healthcare accessible through different support materials, everything from pen and paper to write and draw on, um, different alphabet boards or whatever that could be out there, and also different high-tech solutions. Um, and if you are an experienced clinician, you would already know that support materials is not anything you use without training going before that. And then there is also that sort of more broader concept of enriched environments. And recently there has been uh, the PhD work by Sarah de Sousa from Perth, who has been working with enriching environments um, over there in Western Australia. And I have been writing in the parentheses, both physical and structures. Can we talk about when we talk about um, enriched environments. So we can enrich environments by putting different signs up and making whatever context, it could be a hospital ward more accessible, maybe colors, maybe specific symbols, but it could also be the whole structure. For instance, I know hospitals in Denmark, they have been working a lot with changing the meeting structure so that they become more uh, accessible, more also for people with aphasia. Yes, I have already said this several times, but just to be on the same page, um, is here a few definitions of uh, communication partner training. So Simon Smaggy et al. says communication partner training is a form of environmental intervention in which people around the person with aphasia learn to use strategies and communication resources to aid uh, the individual with aphasia. 
you can read the rest cell, uh, yourself. And there's also another one by Cruz et al. Communication partner training is an umbrella term for complex behavioral intervention for communication partners of people with aphasia. Um, we won't have the time to talk about this today, but it's certainly also with a lot of different interacting components, making it very sort of complex um, and also, or therefore I should say, hard to implement as well. So CBT is a part of making services, the environment, life more accessible to people with aphasia and not just the mechanics of teaching their communication partners uh, something. And we do have a rather large uh, family of CPT within aphasia. There are more coaching type interventions like conversational coaching, aphasia couples therapy. There are interventions based more on a specific linguistic um, idea, philosophy, uh, conversation analysis, like the Spark and the Better Conversations with Aphasia from the UK both. Uh, there could be a supported conversation for adults with aphasia out of the Aphasia Institute in Toronto. They have been inspiring a lot of interventions and studies are also based on sort of that core program as well. And what I will present later, the COMTIL, the a Danish CPT program that is very much also inspired on uh, by SCA. And then we have interventions inspired by or based on uh, the CONNECT model. And I think CONNECT actually also is based on, on SCA and several other interventions that are uh, named as a CPT uh, intervention. So, and, and, and I should add, there's a lot of variety in who is trained, if people with aphasia is not, uh, if people with aphasia is included or not, the amount of training. Uh, however, it's not very well reported when we look at the different reviews. And it's also therefore quite hard to distill the core elements of the training, but often something about knowledge of aphasia, providing different skills and how to be uh, a better conversation partner and uh, some practicing elements as well. Communication partner training has ended up in different clinical guidelines. And here's just a few snapshots from Canada saying that all team members should be trained in supported conversation to be able to interact with patients with communication limitations such as aphasia. Uh, your own um, aphasia uh, pathway in Australia, also talking about uh, CPT that should be provided to improve the communicative environment. And I also have something from, from Denmark here, uh, from the National Board Health uh, Board, and they also recommend to train. It could be SCA, they mentioned that as one of them, but in general, they just talk about communication support for people with aphasia. So what is the story about CPT in Denmark? Well, I can say we surely, I think we can say it's a long now. Uh, we have a long and strong relationship with CPT, uh, primarily uh, through training of speech pathologists in supported conversation for adults with aphasia at the Aphasia Institute in Toronto. So more than 50, I think we are way more than 50 now, but when we did a little survey, back in 2018, it was 50 plus, have gone over to, run, to Toronto, have received the training, and I have been one of them as well. And then they have gone home, we have gone home and started <clears throat> to use it in different ways. Excuse me. And <clears throat> I took those pictures when I was in Toronto and in the hallway, they have this big <clears throat> map of the world and uh, I have a little uh, snapshot of Denmark is actually beneath all the yellow pins here. So as you can see, lots of clinicians have been there. So the story is that actually the first Danish speech pathologist went over there in the mid zeros, 
do you say that? Mid 2000s um, to receive the training. It didn't get a lot of attention back home in Denmark at that time. It was not really until 2011 when my colleague Lisa Randrup Jensen from University of Southern Denmark, she's now retired though, she was asked to um, provide uh, some details for an evaluation report of neurorehabilitation. And she wrote in sort of what we, what she thought was the strongest evidence at that point. And she pointed at um, communication partner training. And that was taken up afterwards, especially by one hospital in the area of Copenhagen, Klostrup Hospital. And, um, and they decided to, to really go for that. So they employed Lisa, first of all, uh, my research colleague from University of Copenhagen. They also in, employed a specific uh, speech pathology, uh, path, uh, sorry, pathologist um, dedicated to implement SCA, and then they trained the whole staff made a lot of planning before, a lot of changes also. And I already briefly mentioned that some hospital have changed their meeting structure. That was also in that hospital where they started doing that. Um, so they call it the involving round ward, ward round, sorry, uh, where they have a speci specific uh, structure that makes it easier to involve people with aphasia. That same hospital at some point also in 2012, made an internal guideline around the use of SCA. And later that was approved as at a regional level. And that region is called the capital region of Denmark. And other hospitals and regions have followed, lately, followed late, later. I have been in 2020 involved in, in, in writing up a clinical guideline for um, my, local hospital, my local hospital where I live. And then at some point, I'm not sure that 2015 is exactly right, but around that time, CPT related to other groups of patients and, and especially TBI, traumatic brain injury, also started to grow. And uh, my now PhD student and Sophie Nielsen and colleagues, they have uh, made a project in the hospital she worked at at that time. And uh, my colleague at University of Copenhagen, a PhD student, Eben Christensen, is also making uh, CPT um, in TBI um, as her PhD project at the, at the moment. And then um, sort of on top of all that, and I think because it was really getting a momentum in Denmark in 2017, the Danish uh, Health Authority uh, makes recommendations for rehabilitation after acquired brain injury, so stroke, but also other types of brain injury. And CPT is that, that point recommended to use when involving uh, patients with fascia, people with fascia. And then I have a little uh, specific point here at 2018, because at that point, Lisa and I made a survey, and I'll present that to you later, or just right after this. Um, and at that point, 12 hospitals have trained their staff in SCA with nine more to come in the near future. And today, I don't have the exact numbers, but when counting the fingers, I think there's might, there might be sort of two acute wards not having done uh, SCA training or other CPT training uh, when they have neurological wards, either acute or rehab, and then a few rehab centers, maybe also one or two. And I think it's also right to say that a few of the hospitals that did training a long time ago, they could benefit from a kind of sort of co-implementation, if you can say so. Um, and then I will also present to you that last sort of bullet here, uh, from 2017 to 20, I have been working with designing a new CPT uh, created through uh, co-design. So this is the three projects I'll talk to you and time is running and I'll try to make it speed up a little bit. Um, so a survey, 
the design of this uh, new CPT intervention. And then if we have the time, I will just briefly mention an interview study that we are writing up at the moment, where we have tried to look at communication support or any sort of kind of, of uh, support going on in healthcare from trained or non-trained staff from the perspectives of people with aphasia, because that is often what we need. We often me measure the, in the interventions we do from the healthcare professionals point of view and not so much uh, from people with aphasia's point of view. So this survey, and I know some of you most likely have heard that before. I'm sorry about that. Um, I have presented it a few times uh, over the last years. Um, so through network, social media, mouth to mouth, and we also contacted the Aphasia Institute, um, we got in touch with those speech pathologists having received uh, SCA training, but also implemented it in different hospital settings. So we, at that point, identified the 12 hospitals I just spoke about before. We gave them a very long questionnaire, 32 items, with closed and open-ended questionnaires. It was not sent directly, or yes, it was sent directly to the speech pathologist, but they were asked to fill it out together with whatever team they were working with in terms of the CPT implementation. So sometimes, in some cases, it was their colleague SLP, uh, and in other cases, cases, it was a more multidisciplinary team like a, a little advocacy team or whatever, uh, however they had organized themselves. They all replied uh, and two of the sites, they had quite limited um, or quite partially implemented SCA, but we include them anyway in, in the study. So you can see a map here. I'm sitting right here now in the middle of the country. Uh, and you can see there is no green dot, there is no red dot, even though there is a big university hospital here in Odense. So I hope one day to be able to do a study there and it's sort of a little bit in the planning. So really at now all the red dots should also be green uh, and some more would be there as well if I was drawing uh, this map today. So some of the results of this study. Um, the 12 hospitals, as you saw, are located all over the country. And most of the hospitals had only one relevant ward where the staff was trained. So it was not like training the whole hospital, but the relevant ward. Um, and usually it was all professions that got trained in some places also secretaries, service workers, porters, three sites also mentioning training students of all professions and one site mentioning uh, mentions training volunteers from Red Cross and another the hospital pastor and quite funnily I have stumbled upon that hospital um, pastor later on. I have a master's student that just completed her, her thesis uh, here in, in this month um, and, and she was interviewing some people with aphasia about their sort of spiritual needs. And they had both been in that hospital where that trained hospital pastor was placed and had very much benefited from her um, ability to being able to communicate with them. Yes, but um, back in 2018, it was actually more than 1,500 staff that were trained um, in seven sites, between 80 and 100% of the relevant staff was trained and at, at other sites it was less. And the two sites with under 10% was the sites I referred to here uh, in the former slides that they had done only this sort of very partially implementation of, of CPT. The trainers, uh, were all uh, speech pathologists, one or two usually at all the sites, and all the trainers had attended the full institute training at the Aphasia Institute. 
before starting this. Two of the sites also involve people with aphasia as co-trainers to practice the learned skill, skills with. Um, time for training was ranging between half an hour up to 12 hours. Um, and again, there was also a big difference, like the half hour training that was in one of those hospitals with only the sort of the partial model. Um, and the content of the training um, was mainly about methods to support conversation. And half of the sites uh, reported back that not all staff got the same training. It could be, um, or I think it's, it's right to say it was especially uh, the doctors getting a special training uh, because they tended not to join uh, the regular uh, training. And I also recognize that from later projects I have been involved in. And uh, some more results map onto implementation drivers as described in Fixin et al. Um, and they are parted into competency drivers, organizational drivers, and leadership drivers. Um, I won't go over all of this, uh, but I think it's very important to say that uh, or look at the leadership drivers at four of the sites speech pathologists took the initiative to train and implement supported conversation at four sites it was the management and at another four sites it was a joint initiative from staff management and the speech uh, uh, pathologist as, as a specific staff group um, and 10 sites agree or somewhat agree that the management support, uh, support the use of supported conversation, but so in some instances, act, more action is needed. So first of all, this doesn't need to come top down. It could be a more sort of bottom, bottom up approach. Um, what has been working quite well in some of the places is what's written up here that uh, some uh, are preparing the training or some did prepare the training with a cross disciplinary or interdisciplinary champion group, support group. Uh, many of the sites later on have had follow up training, brush up courses, spe special presentations and staff meetings, newsletters. Um, 10 of the sites also have developed materials to, to support the uh, daily communication. So it's not just about providing the training, it's also about having materials ready at hand uh, that you can use when you have been trained. Yeah, I think that is what I'll dive into at this point. Um, and we also asked uh, what was needed in the future to maintain the use of supported communication. And uh, follow-up training was the most prominent. More time for speech pathologists to uh, follow around the, daily, the staff and, and give some daily supervision or daily support. It could be more support from the staff. So the staff that had been trained, that they are really sort of uh, willing to support this initiative and use uh, what they have been trained in. And the rest you can see. Um, yourself. So a few conclusions of this study. It's often grassroots led, uh, not, as, you, as I mentioned before, not necessarily initiated by the management. Often it was not a project, but simply a change of procedures. Um, so that also meant in terms of uh, financing that it was often money coming from um, from continued professional development or just from the annual budget of the ward. So not necessarily a grant that they have been out um, applying for. Therapists seems more likely to use supported communication than care staff. So speech therapists, um, OTs and PTs, uh, whereas um, especially doctors were enhanced as being uh, most problematic in terms of, or most resistant in terms of the take up of, of the training uh, content. More support is needed from staff and management, but 
still good agreement about their support for using a supported conversation. They are all now facing some of the same challenges, as I mentioned before, uh, but the participants think it's better to have aphasia at, the, at their wards now uh, compared to before the training. And then I will move over to another project, so COMTIL, which is a co-designed CPT program for health professionals. It was a large project aiming at developing a cohesive pathway for people with aphasia, and in that CPT became a core component. Um, it was service development, not research, which <laughs> also is is sort of uh, quite clear in terms of, of how we could. Uh, and when I say we, it was not necessarily me uh, or the other researcher I was working with on this, uh, how we did the data collection. And yeah, sometimes things happen that I think I would have done differently. But that's the way it is when, when you're working in the real world and not behind your desk. And uh, why did we not use supported conversation for adults with aphasia? Uh, well, it was because the Danish, uh, because we wanted to look more into and try to design something for the Danish cross sectorial context. We have a system, I guess you have that in Australia and in other countries as well, where we sort of move a lot uh, around between different sectors and where it's not necessarily. Uh, or where it becomes hard to to transfer the the uh, the information needed along with the patient. So we had like a slightly other approach for that, and uh, it should set the current emphasis on PPI, public and patient involvement, and co-design. So we also wanted to to try to involve the relevant stakeholders. I'll talk more to you about that later. Um, and also when looking at the CPT evidence, it's not weak, but it's weakest in the acute and sub-acute contexts. So we wanted to maybe create something that accommodated a little bit for that. I think I've forgotten a slide where I explain what COMTIL means. It, it, it actually means something. It's short for communicative uh, accessibility, communicative tilgängelighed, but it also sort of plays on the, on the words at COMTIL uh, to, uh, to be given a chance. It's, I, yeah, I guess I can translate it with that. So the context was over here uh, where I live, uh, southwestern Jutland. Um, and we have two regional hospitals, one covering acute neurology and the other neurorehabilitations, and then five surrounding municipalities. Quite a bit of a difference between those municipalities also meaning when we have been working on the implementation, I'll not talk so much about that today, but we have like this little island with 3,500 uh, people living there. And then we have the big muni municipality Espia where I live with uh, 115,000 people. So also very easy in some ways to implement when you need to train 20 staff and then you have been training all the rehab staff in the whole municipality as it was on Feyenoord, that little island, compared to uh, the bigger municipality, Espia. Yes, I need to follow a little bit along here in my manuscripts. So it all started with uh, a nurse at an acute stroke board uh, suggesting that the stroke team should be taught conversation partner training. But because, as I said, that the, the evidence is not as strong in the acute and rehab setting, settings, we ended up with this aim of creating a more connected and cohesive rehabilitation journal for people with aphasia through better communication despite transitioning from sectors and me meeting many different professionals. So the idea was that all staff, or it became the idea that all staff should be trained the same way, should use the same support materials, and in that way, create a cohesive care pathway. 
However, at this point when we started, it could potentially include partner training and other things, but we didn't really know because we wanted to base our study on co-design. So we didn't really know what ideas we would end up uh, with developing further. So a little bit about this quite messy journey we have been on. First of all, as I said, it was never research. So we have done things that you can shake your head and think now, well, why did they do that? That was reality at that time. <laughs> uh, and also the grant we got was for service improvement. At the bottom of our slide, uh, we have three different, or you can see three different phases. Um, but we have also tried to name different activities, not all, but many of them. Uh, I will regard as quite essential. And as most other projects, we have had sort of an extensive phase zero, um, where our ideas were formed in a large project group representing different stake or not different all stakeholders, so staff from different phases, different professions, different experience, but also people with aphasia and family members. Um, and, um, and then we started in July 2017 after having received funding with our phase one. Uh, and that was a quite sort of classic ethnographic study of the current status and the literature review. And the literature review was not systematic in any way. It was sort of, yeah, little desk review trying to Im inform what we wanted to do. And the ethnographic study was not really scientific and it was not me or any or the other researcher doing it. It was a health innovation agency here in the region that, that made this. Phase two was uh, based on co-design with people with aphasia. So where we uh, developed ideas and concepts and verified and tested what we developed. Um, I'll also tell you more about that later. And then we were ready to implement from, yeah, we started training our training trainers in, I think it was in March, 2019. They went out and trained their colleagues in uh, from August and the rest of 2019. And then we actually had uh, all of 2020 to work to support, to work with supporting the implementation. However, as you know, it was COVID and not, not everything was done as we had planned to do from the beginning. So some of the results from the first phase, um, uh, where that health agency went out and made an ethnographic study. They, obs they did observations of communication between staff and people with aphasia both in hospitals and other health settings. Additionally, uh, they also talked to some uh, of those people about uh, their experiences, needs, and opinions of communication support and accessibility. And every time we sort of parted it in, into those three stakeholder groups. So the health professionals, people with aphasia, and family members. And as you can see here, that was some of what they expressed. They wanted to feel safe. Family members also wanted to feel safe when they left their loved ones with aphasia. Uh, people with aphasia or health professionals would like to be uh, taught in supporting conversations. So actually all of this were made into to goals for the further project and not least goals for the, for the CPT we developed. And based on findings from phase one and experiences from the um, PPI contributors, we um, we started to 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 develop a, a lot of different ideas. So from the beginning, it was the idea was to just brainstorm on ideas and further develop ideas, and then take some of the uh, the ideas that were realizable within this project period and within the funding frame, and 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 then implement it. So still at that point, we didn't know that it would be a CPT program. That sort of just took, took form. And I think I've already told you who the, who the contributors were for our public and patient involvement um, process. And uh, yeah, you can see here when we have been working with 
the stakeholders and who the stakeholders or the contributors have been and what the purpose has been, but I, sorry, I don't have the time to go over it. I should just have deleted it from the beginning. Sorry about that. Um, and here's some results from, or some of the results from phase one then became artifacts for the phase two. So in phase one, for example, we made a patient journey. We made some personas, like sort of stereotype, uh, people with aphasia, stereotype, family members, stereotype, health professionals, and then worked with them uh, in mind to create, um, first of all, those rooms of opportunities that was also an, an artifact sort of uh, from, from phase one. So we were asked to work in five different groups with each of this room of opportunity and try to develop something more concrete. And what, yeah, just a few snapshots here from, from the co-design uh, phase. It was quite fun. Um, here are health professionals in those two, uh, in those two pictures. And here, I think it's students together with people with aphasia making some prioritization. So each time we involved people with aphasia and family members, we invited quite a few students here from SDU in so that each person with aphasia would have a communication support, a personal communication support in, in the form of a student. And some of the ideas we created uh, are here. So we created a symbol that should be at the bedside, files, wherever, to make sure that everyone know or knew that this person has aphasia and is li and likely needs support. So that you, if you are a staff, saw that symbol, you knew that you most likely were to use the support you had been taught because that was also a result, conversation partner training to all health professionals, plus a need, a need to, uh, to include that in a local guideline or a local procedure, which, is it, which it already is all uh, now, um, which is up here. So the clinical guideline of how to treat people with aphasia right from the beginning when entering the hospital and right through to the end when they are, um, going out to community care. And then a digital and an analog toolbox to support conversations. I will skip a little bit here. So the training context, it's definitely uh, inspired by other programs, as I've already said, especially support conversation for adults with fascia. Uh, the program is two times three hours approximately two weeks between to give time to practice skills. First round is more theoretic, theoretically heavy than the second time. And we focus on uh, variation of the training, lectures, videos, role plays, etc. And the trainers will have uh, some material, not some material, a lot of material at, at hand. So around 60 slides, eight videos in Danish reflecting the Danish context, which I think was really, really, really nice. And I think that was much needed because we all came back from the Aphasia Institute with the Canadian videos, uh, and they were all speech pathologists sitting at a table with the person with aphasia, and the person with aphasia was uh, definitely not very acute, but quite further down their pathway. Um, we have different tasks, we have a role play bank, even though we encourage to adapt the role plays to the specific local context. We have a toolbox with materials um, and we have a training manual. And here's sort of the core of our pro uh, program, but I won't have time to go over it today. So it, uh, come till uh, CPT has the same approach as SCA. So you train the trainer. And in the project, we trained 18 trainers. What is different compared to SCA is that trainers does not necessarily need to be uh, speech pathologists. They can have other professions as well. And I think that was some that worked really well and is really meaningful because then you send a nurse out to train her nursing colleagues uh, at her own ward instead of like sort of that more sort of guest speech pathologist coming there. 
Uh, and we continue to train um, COMTIL trainers. It has been in the university and right now we are just, we are making it in a communication center instead, or we are planning to do that in the, fu in the future. And I know that those first 18 trainers, they continue to train their colleagues, which is really nice. And now I'll just flicker through the rest because I have prepared way too much and I'm sorry about that. So here are some materials. We have, uh, we had new pictures drawn. So each, and I don't even have it here with me on the desk. Yes, no, no, it's not here. So each, each person with a fascia get a personal toolbox with those pictures, yes, no cards, um, scale, maps, alphabet boards, all sorts of things. And then of hygienic reasons, they need to bring the materials or they need to have the materials with them, but it's the re responsibility of the trained staff to go in and use that. Um, yeah. And we have been evaluating that. And as you can see here, um, just a very sort of brief, brief uh, look at that. So we have a baseline. We have an eight, eight week after education and we have a one year after education. We have been using the health professionals and aphasia questionnaire that uh, Lisa and Eben and myself have developed with some students. Um, and you can see they do move. They do become better in terms at least of, of it's a self-reported questionnaire. They think they do no more, have better skills. Uh, after training and what is really nice to, to see or what was really nice to see is that it's maintained one year after the education. And I think I will skip the last project and uh, perhaps you can look at the recording afterwards with the slides and, and see our small results. And then I can just mention that uh, we are also working internationally with training trainers in we have just trained a group in two groups in India, Serbia, Egypt, uh, Austria, uh, and Greece. And the Austrian team is uh, starting to train their colleagues at the beginning of July. And uh, as uh, Marcella said, uh, I'm just have just started working on a new project uh, of uh, on families with aphasia and their care pathway, and perhaps. It will end up with the inclusion of CPT for family members. We don't know yet because we're also making a lot of co-design here. And I have already sort of indicated that a dream could be to do a, a bigger CPT study with more robust design and a larger number of participants, hopefully at the university hospital here. That's at least my big dream. And then I think we certainly also need more focus on, in, on the implementation phase after CPT. So thank you. And sorry for rushing over the end here and not completing it. Thank you so much, Yuta. Um, what an impressive body of work um, you've just presented. And we would have loved to have had more time to delve mm -hmm. into more of the details um, of your work. Um, we've got a question, we've got questions coming through on the Q&A, um, but one question that I wanted to ask um, was about the resistance from doctors that mm. you noted in your mm. first study, mm. and of course they're trained in a very different mm. way to us. Do you have any data from the doctors about what would help them to, with buy-in into something like mm. CPT? Mm. No. For, fortunately not. I had a student trying to, to work with that in her bachelor thesis, and uh, at least they, the, it, was, it was GPs, it was not hospital doctors she was interviewing, and they talk a lot about time. Um, I think they also, many of them actually see themselves as quite good communication partners maybe because they are used to not just speaking to the patient, but the whole family. So I guess they, they think, I don't know, I'm just guessing now, that if I'm able to communicate with the family, with the spouse, with the partner, 
that is good enough. That is good communication. Um, I don't know. Actually, that 2020 follow up phase we had that I said was changed quite a bit due to COVID. Um, the plan was to, to interview the hospital doctors, but we never got the chance because they got caught up in COVID business. No, that's and that's fair. Yeah. Um, but interesting that their lack of buy in or their hesitation doesn't seem to have damaged the momentum of, mm. of the training program in general. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No, I don't think so. And also, I think they're at least that's what I hear. They do learn something. They do display, at least that's what my colleagues in out in, in the what out in the hospitals, what they say, that they buy into the new knowledge and also some of those skills, but maybe also become better at involving other people then. Hey, can you come and, and yeah. maybe help me here because I'm not quite sure what to do. Yeah. But a big problem, I think, uh, also because those hospitals that we have been working with are quite you can't say anything is really a rule here in Denmark but it's still it's 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 not that prestigious to work in Espia compared to in Copenhagen so it's often um, training doctors it's the doctors from other countries and sort of doctors that are just through there for a very short period and in that way not that interested don't pay that much attention to communication mm. as something specific yeah it's another layer of challenge another barrier yeah, yeah. uh we have a question from maya uh, menehemi falkov thank you for a wonderful talk why do you think the evidence is lower in the acute and subacute phases what is the strength of the evidence in the chronic mm. phase <laughs> sorry i don't have the time to go over this i don't i don't think the evidence is weaker it, it's shown in the in the two systematic reviews and um, first of all uh, low numbers in those studies and very hard to get the training um or, or to to uptake the training still i'm 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 right now I'm thinking, sorry, I'm thinking while I'm trying to talk uh, about a study from Nina Simmons Maggie and colleagues back in 2007. And I think they compare, they have an acute setting, they do training in a subacute setting or rehab setting, and then like a more care home, nursing home facility. And they say it becomes better in terms of using the strategies. Mm -hmm. So quite low in acute care because, um, it's um, there's just so much focus on on life and death and and other factors that are regarded as more important in this phase slightly better at rehab and more time in the acute phase but we have actually seen a little bit not the opposite but very good staff in at the rehab setting because they have so much experience in communicating and working longer periods with people with aphasia acute yes they are busy but they are still using this nursing homes not so much but i think it's also the way we have been working with them and we have had a bigger focus on on hospitals also in our, our project even though we didn't intend to do so so the evidence is there and and that's also the conclusions of of uh, simmons maggie and colleagues in both the 10 and the 16 review that bigger studies, better studies are needed. And, and just if I can follow up on Maya's question, what do you think are the best ways to measure the effects mm -hmm. of these training programs? Because we often see measures focusing on self-reports of yeah. confidence, yeah. And knowledge and attitudes. Yeah. What do you think are the best measures? Oh, <laughs> that is a really, really good question. I think I think we should use the the self-reported outcome measures because I think they have some truth to it. <laughs> I don't think they are completely lying about what they report about themselves. And it's it's easy, it's quite, yeah, it's easy to administer, it's easy to use uh, the data it produces. But I would love to do some more like observational um, data collection but the problem then is how to rate the observations then and then I think we need very much um, 
a, some self-reported or some some tool um, capturing the point of view of people with aphasia, which is hard because you can't give them a pre-post questionnaire. Who was there pre-training <laughs> is not there at the ward post-training. Um, yeah, I have a, a master student um, that just completed sort of the um, initial um, development of such a questionnaire together actually with mm -hmm. uh, Kira Chickens and Emma Power and Kirsten Shropsold from Australia as well. So we hope at some point that could maybe be a tool also to use uh, for such studies here. Watch this space. <laughs> we have a couple more questions. Uh, Robin Gibson sends her thanks for a great presentation and a wonderful series of projects and asks, what else do you dream of for people with aphasia? What would it look like in a perfect world? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think we could make a good uh, ideas generation amongst us here <laughs> today. Um, I hope, like from a researcher's point of view, uh, I hope that we can be able to make research that are so good that it will have a clinical uptake and reach guidelines. It's already there in the guidelines, but even though it is there in the guidelines that we should support people with, a con co uh, with communication disorders as aphasia, there's still not that sort of really sort of solid understanding of yes of course we should and now we do it uh, so i think better studies to in that way convince the decision makers of course this needs to be mandatory i think it would be wonderful if we could do some initial training um, already of all healthcare students. I don't think it should be the only training. I think we should start there and then continue when you go out. Like we already see in Denmark how it's mandatory to do CPT training when you start at certain hospitals. I think that is also wonderful and I would like that to be something done everywhere. So as you can hear, different ideas, good research, robust research uh, in order to to get the clinical world um, move differently, I don't know. And and that's the reality, isn't it? It's such a complex yeah. space that yeah. it's not a one it's not one approach that's going to work. It's probably multiple approaches and a three hundred and sixty degree view. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think we do need a lot more knowledge and also to work a lot more with the implementation research. Like it. it, it we often also, also as researchers, we, we, we leave the projects too early. <laughs> we go out, we do some kind of training or intervention, and then we pull out and expect it to live on its own. And I think that's, that is not good. <laughs> no, it's not life. <laughs> no. Um, Edwina Lamburn has written, uh, this is such an impressive and interesting scope of work. Thanks so much for your presentation. I'm really interested to know more about whether health staff are changing their practice after training and how this might be impacting interactions with people with aphasia. Is this something you have included in any of your studies or are there plans to investigate this in the future? And she says it sort of ties in with my measurement question. Yeah. Um Yes, we actually, after the Comtil uh, project, we got a smaller grant here from University of Southern Denmark to uh, look into how could support it, how could healthcare communication. But I think in the beginning, I, I thought of naively thought it would be how to look at how supported communication looked like versus non-supported communication. And we made out uh, and we went out and recruited um, hospitals that we knew had done, uh, trained their staff, and hospitals that we knew hadn't trained their staff. When we look at the data, <laughs> in terms of the interviews we have made with people with aphasia, we don't see a big difference. And that was what I was meant to present to you today, but didn't have the time to do. So, unfortunately, but still, when looking into the data, we, we interviewed 14 people with aphasia in acute and subacute stages, and they all are quite positive about, um, about the way the staff communicate. Yes, there are room for improvement, 
But I wonder if that sort of focus we, after all, have had over the last 10, uh, 15 years here in Denmark has made a difference uh, so that people do feel supported also when meeting not trained staff because the trained staff also in many places are aware of um, SCA and other programs. I don't know. It, I'm just guessing. Although, then I should add, we also have video recordings of, um, of health uh, care communication situations. And uh, I have not been looking at them yet, but my colleague Dord Hansen has, and she says, yes, she thinks there is a difference hmm. when you are speaking to a trained person or a non-trained person, but it's more subtle. Um, and we, yeah, we have just started tr transcribing data and we'll make a conversation analytic study of that. That would be so fascinating, especially yeah. to show it to blinded readers and see if they can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure it's that yeah. visible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um. Well, listen, we have we have reached the end of our time with you today, Yuta. Thank you once again um, so much for sharing such an, uh, an interesting um, set of work. It's always fascinating to hear about what's going on in another country. And I think quite a few of us are probably quite green with envy at uh, the momentum that you've managed to, um, to establish in Denmark. Uh, I just want to finish up by saying um, our next seminar um, will folks will hear from uh, Dr. Sarah Wallace, who will present on driving quality improvements through meaningful evaluation of aphasia services, the measures project. Please join us uh, on Wednesday, the 27th of July to hear from Sarah. Follow us on Twitter and via our community of practice for details of how to register for the seminar. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.